Welcome to this session of the Intuitive Medicine Summit, where we'll explore ways to intuitively participate in our own healing. I'm Lisa Von Ace, your host, and my guest for this session is Dr. Jennifer Lisa Vest. Our topic today is the path of the medical mystic. Dr. Vest is a medical intuitive, mystic, ceremonialist, healer, and teacher. She's the author of The Ethical Psychic and host of the podcast, Journal of a Medical Intuitive. Dr. Vest, thank you so much for being with us today. Welcome. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm so glad that you're here. I love to hear people's stories, and I would love if you would tell us, how did you become a medical intuitive? These stories are always so fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of a long and windy route, but... Um... I think it's I think it's a, a an important story for a lot of people who come to medical intuitives. You know, I started out on the other side of the gurney, so to speak. I was the person who was very sick. I had a medical mystery. It took my doctors ten years to diagnose me with my heart condition, and um, and so I was going to all kinds of healers and naturopaths and therapists, and really, you know, struggling. And so that taught me a lot of compassion. And it really put me on the path to becoming a medical intuitive uh, because I went to see a medical intuitive on my father's um, advice. And she told me that I needed to develop my gifts in order to get better. And I had had gifts since I was born, but I had a kind of uneasy relationship with them. I would kind of love them, hate them. And, um, and so I would get training from time to time as I was growing up from different traditional healers, but they always approached me. I never, I never sought it out. And I was trying to just live a regular life. I had a very kind of mainstream academic life where I was pursuing multiple degrees, became a professor. And then in the middle of that, I started to get some serious training um, in psychic development and, and healing. And it was in the context of those courses that my medical intuition gift came out really strongly. And so in my classes, you know, the teacher would say, oh, you know, do a reading on your classmate. And I would always get medical information. I took mediumship and we're bringing through spirit. And I was always getting cause of death and illness for the deceased. And so my teacher said to me, you know, you have this gift. It's very rare. You should focus on this. And there weren't any teachers for medical intuition back then. And so I tried to find, uh, you know, medical intuition courses. I even went to a couple of workshops that that were called medical intuition, but clearly were not. <laughs> they were just like intuition classes. And what I had to do was, um, you know, I just, I had studied with a lot of different, um, you know, healers and, and teachers and mediums. And, and then I had to form my own um, medical intuition circle. And I was actually able to get my teachers to join the circle with me because by that time I had advanced enough that we were colleagues of sorts, although I wasn't practicing professionally, I was still a philosophy professor. I had, you know, no intention of ever doing this for work. <laughs> and um, so I thought, but I was just wanting to help people. And so we just formed a circle. We started having people just give us people's names, people we didn't know. And we would just use the name and do uh, scans on them remotely. And then I would type up these 10 page reports and mail them off. And then we would wait for the feedback. And that's how we developed. And, and then, I, um, then I started just volunteering, you know, at churches, at metaphysical bookstores, just doing sessions for all my friends and family and getting feedback, more and more feedback, practice, practice. And eventually I did hang a shingle and start working professionally in Los Angeles. Um, and I worked as a professional medical intuitive for the last 12 years. Wow. I see. I knew it's going to be an interesting story. They always are. Now, so I want to ask you, uh, because uh, so many of the people that I've talked to, um, they have a different it's just a different way that it expresses. So when you are scanning somebody, um, are you seeing, are you hearing, tasting? What is it that what kind of information comes to you? Well, um, I might be unique among medical intuitives um, in that I use all of the clairs. And so I use clairvoyance, clear seeing, I use clear audience, clear hearing, I use clear sentience to, bring, to pull the person's symptoms into my body and then examine myself. Um, I use clear cognizance to scan lists of ailments. I use telepathy where I actually talk to the organs. And um, I use something called resonance, which I, I kind of made up 
which is where I listen to information that comes in between people's words when they're telling me the story of their illness. And so I combine all of those gifts. And so I receive information in so many different ways. I see inside the body. I, um, I can feel their symptoms. I can feel their emotions. And then I can actually hear their organs talking to me. Um, and then I also, I just get clear cognitive, which is like, you know, just really quick hits of, of true, false, yes, no, or, you know, and sometimes I'll hear the name of an ailment. So the, I use all of those gifts together. And that's, that's how I teach my students to do medical intuition. And that's in part because of my training. You know, one of the mediums that trained me back in Casadega, I was trained in a spiritualist community among other places, you know, was an evidential medium. And we were taught to use all of our clairs. And a lot of times we're born with a very strong clair, like we're, we're born clairvoyant, we see or we're born clairsentient, we're empathic, we feel. And a lot of times people will just kind of rely on that gift, their strong gift to work. And so you'll see a lot of medical intuitives who are clairvoyants, you know, or they're clairsentients. Um, but my teacher, um, Maida Jones, you know, she insisted that we had to work on our weakest gifts and we had to have all of our you know, gifts. And she, she taught me that. And that's how I teach now. I said, no matter if you think, oh, I've never heard, I'm never going to be a clear audience. Yes, you are. You're going to be a clear audience. You're going to practice until you can do it. <laughs> and um, having all of those gifts on board, you just it's just a lot easier to get um, more information. Right, right. So do you find that um, because you're using, you've got a lot of tools in your toolbox, uh, do different people deliver the messages in different ways, if, if that question makes sense. Well, the delivery of what you get is really half of it. <laughs> um, so much of what makes a medical intuitive, a good medical intuitive, is how she or he is able to deliver information in a way that the client can hear it and in a way that's not going to be upsetting. And so that's another thing I teach is the importance of language and of being very, very sensitive and careful with how you phrase things and being tuned in to the client to know, you know, how do they need to hear things? So for example, when I have people come to me as clients who are medical professionals, I tend to get a lot of the session in medical terminology and like anatomy because they need to hear it that way because for them, that's what makes it authentic. And there are other people, if I were to use all those terms, they would be put off or they would be confused. And so with other people, I have to use more uh, general language. And then also I find that I have to use vague language when it comes to something very um, serious or disturbing. So, and I have to avoid certain language. So for example, I never tell my clients they have cancer. Because cancer is so loaded, people just are so terrified of cancer that if you say the word cancer, people immediately think they're going to die. And then you could have a self-fulfilling prophecy there. You know, someone just thinks cancer and then they, they will themselves to death unconsciously, right? And so then I also will use vague language. I'll say things like, well, you have a condition which, you know, if you don't address it, it could turn into cancer, right? And I might say, you know, this is urgent. You need to like go to the doctor tomorrow and have this test run. And, um, and I'll say it, like if, it, if they need to hear it urgently, I'll say it urgently. But if it's someone who's already afraid, then I'm gonna be like more careful. And you know, I had this funny instance where I was working with a nurse and of course I didn't know she was a nurse. I never know much about my clients because I don't wanna know upfront anything about them. And so a lot of times I don't know who I'm talking to and then they'll tell me afterwards. And, and this person was a nurse and I was giving her language about what was going on with her adrenal glands. And she had cancer in her adrenal glands, but I didn't want to say cancer. So I was like, hey, this is the test you should get, you know, go to your doctor and ask for this test. And then, you know, that, then he'll be, he'll be able to, he'll, he'll be able to, uh, her doctor was a man at the time. He'll be able to, um, you know, treat this. Well, she was a nurse, so she knew what that test was. <laughs> and so afterwards she said, well, you just confirm what I already suspected. I, I have cancer, adrenal cancer, and you just confirm that because the test you told me to get is a test for adrenal cancer. <laughs> so I thought I was being slick. <laughs> but yeah, language is really important, how you deliver it. Yeah, yeah. Now, speaking of language, you used a word uh, a couple of minutes ago that I would love to hear more about. You said uh, it's something that you do called called resonance, where you're listening to the silence between the words. And 
I love that baby. I don't, and that's one of those things that I know it's going to be hard to put it into English language, but if you could explain a little further, I'd love that. Okay. Well, you know, I have to uh, give credit to my students because I was teaching, I started teaching medical intuition in person a few years ago um, throughout um, Southern and Northern California. And then during the pandemic, I started a medical intuition certificate course online, on, you know, on Zoom. And while I was teaching it, one of the cohorts, I remember I got to this point where I said, oh, I have this other gift I use, but I don't know what it's called. And so I described it. And one of my students said, oh, resonance. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, that's a perfect name for it. And so here's what it is. I don't like my clients to talk a lot, but some, some clients do need to talk and that's okay. But I, as a medical intuitive, we don't get information from what the client says. Um, we get it from their body right? Or we get it energetically. And so often what they say is irrelevant um, to, to a large extent. And so I don't ask for medical histories. I don't ask for the history of the illness. I just say, you know, what's your question or what's your uh, symptom or what's the body part you want me to look at? And it can be something as vague as um, I'm tired all the time. Tell me why. Right. Um, and so but some people might talk a little more. They might say, well, I have this problem with ringing in my ears and I've had it for 10 years and I just have tried everything, right? That's the statement they make. While they're making that statement, you know, I'm mostly not listening to them, not in a disrespectful way, but just in a way of like, I'm trying to listen to something else. And so I'm listening to the, the sound behind the sound of their words. And so I'll actually, it's like, it's like there's two audio tracks running, you know, they're saying, you know, I have ringing in the ears. It's been going on for 10 years. And then I'm hearing at the same time, confusion. I might hear like confusion. Um, and then that'll let me know that there's a mental aspect to this condition around confusion or that the, the, the ringing in the ears is causing a lot of mental confusion. Right. So there'll be this additional information. It's like stuff they didn't say, but it's still a part of what they're saying. And so I call that resonance. And I, I, I'm, I'm describing it probably not totally accurately because it's not as clear as clear audience. It's not necessarily always a word. Sometimes it's a feeling. So it's, it's not one of the, it's not a clear, like clear audience or clear sentience. It's kind of a mixture of clear audience and clear sentience, which is why I call it something else. Yeah, yeah, what it's reminding me of, um, have you seen the movie Contact with Jodie Foster? I think so. Well, there's a, there's, there's a scene in the movie where they're receiving um, this information from, from the radio telescopes uh, uh, from space, and they're watching, uh, I, I don't have the scientific words, but they're watching the pulsations on the screen, uh, and one of them realizes, wait, there's a second signal in there, and they do their... <laughs> their, their manipulations, whatever it is they do scientifically, and they realize that beneath the audio track, there's a video signal as well. So they have to break that down so they can see and hear. And that's kind of what it sounds like. That's that very, it's tracks. very similar. Yeah, it, it is like that. It's like a, some, an extra track of information embedded in that you have to. Yeah, it's definitely like that. Um, and it, it's vibrational. So it's it's also hard to describe because it doesn't correlate exactly with the senses like the other clairs do. It's it's vibrational. Um, but it's coming from them. It's coming from the voice as they're speaking. It's coming from not the words, but the 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 vibration of the voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this I, I'm I'm intrigued by this. Um, <laughs> is this something? Well, let, let's go back to you. You teach the classes online. Uh, what sort of things do you teach in your class? And do you find it a challenge to teach medical intuition online, or is it just the same as being in person? Yeah, I don't find it to be uh, any different, and that's probably because prior to the pandemic. I was already seeing clients online. And so I have clients in other countries who would do sessions with me on Zoom. And so when the pandemic hit, I just, I hadn't been teaching any classes on Zoom, but I just moved them online. And it, it wasn't a problem because this type of work doesn't require that you are in the same room with the person. You know, like I said, when I first started out uh, doing this, I did it all remotely. In fact, I didn't do in-person sessions the first few years that I was practicing. I used to just 
do them all remotely and send a written report. And I actually transitioned to in-person because it was easier. It was less work. (laughs) When I was doing it remotely, I was just typing up these, I was just getting way too much information and typing up these massive reports. And it just wasn't, it wasn't cost effective. (laughs) Once I started getting so many clients, it just, I couldn't keep it up. And I realized that in person, I could get, um, I could get information um, you know, just an hour's worth of info. I could kind of delimit the work to one hour instead of working on it for so long. And, you know, with, that was better. Um, of course, some psychics, you know, may, uh, I suppose if there wasn't a pandemic, some of my students might have preferred to learn in person because maybe it was would be easier for some psychics who, um, are used to working that way. And that's just a, that's just a crutch. That's just a habit. Like, like I told you, I was taught, you know, I have, I had a lot of different teachers and you know, I was taught in, uh, you know, Native American, Jamaican, Trinidadian, African-American traditions and spiritualists. And so I had a lot of different teachers teaching me different things. So I learned to be adaptable and flexible and I learned to combine those different ways of doing things. And so I have no, no rigidity of a tradition, of one tradition. And so, um, but some people do, and that that can be a crutch where they only want to work in person or they only want to work with certain tools or, you know, they have certain things that they have to have. And, you know, what I, what I teach is that you should be able to work um, under any circumstances if needed. And of course we want to work in ideal circumstances to be at our best. Um, But, but, Sometimes you have to work in other circumstances and, and that's okay. Um, so I didn't find any problem with teaching online, but um, with regard to your other question, how, how did I teach online? Was that your other question? <laughs> it was one <laughs> of them, yes, yes. I got I so many questions. <laughs> how do I teach it? Um, you know, for many years, I didn't know if it could be taught because I was not taught it by a medical intuitive. I had gifts my whole life. I had, yes, I have lots of teachers. I, I did a lot of, um, I did a lot of instruction, um, but I didn't have someone who specifically taught me how to be a medical intuitive. I should say I didn't have someone human. I have spirit teachers that have worked with me my whole life. And so they've been with me my whole life. And I saw when I first started doing healing work, I had these spirit doctors who used to you know be right here and directing me. And so I thought, can I teach this? But my students kept asking me to teach it. And so what I did was I just began to reflect on my process, that I, the process I had developed to do medical intuition over years. And I call it the VEST protocol, and it's a series of steps. And so I teach those steps to my students. And I say, the reason I'm teaching you this way is because this is the way I work. And you may work a different way after you train with me. You may add on other steps or remove steps but I'm giving you a foundation and I'm teaching you what I know, right? Which is all you could teach. You have to teach from where you come. And so my protocol involves teaching them how to develop, um, how to do a clairvoyant scan, for example, how to scan somebody like an MRI and actually see problems in the body, how to um, zoom into a problem clairvoyantly, how to clairsentiently take your aura and wrap it over your client and pull their symptoms into your body. And then to begin to examine yourself like you're in a doctor's office, how to um, connect with an organ and begin a dialogue, what questions to ask. Uh, And so I have this, this process that I, that I teach them. And uh, you know, I didn't know when I started, if it was going to (laughs) work. And I, my students are a mixture of like healthcare workers and psychics and healers. And, um, and it it works somehow the best protocol works. And, um, and that's what my students say. They, they were able to use it. Like I have a lot of them, they're already in practice. Like they're, it's, they're already a nurse. They're already a massage therapist already. I haven't, I have one who's like an acupuncturist who runs an acupuncture school. And they said they were able to take what I taught them and immediately, uh, like after the training, begin to incorporate it into their practice. Um, So apparently (laughs) it works. (laughs) Wow. So, okay. Uh, I have two uh, very strong questions in mind that I want to remember. Uh, One is I wanted to ask you about um, 
let's start with this one. Uh, you say that uh, you you bring the symptoms in, and I know that there are some people who who may be just learning uh, to do healing work, Reiki, etc., where they will find themselves feeling the symptoms, but they don't know how to release them. And then they end up having all this extra gunk in their bodies. How do you recommend that people don't hold on to? It's a, it's a real risk. I call it uh, being an out of control clairsentient. <laughs> and most of us have been out of control clairsentients at one point in our development. I certainly was for the first like 25 years of my life, always picking up other people's symptoms, always sick, going, going into a hospital. I was miserable. I was just feeling all of the the um, illnesses, not only of the sick people, but the dead people as well. And so um, learning to control your clairsentience is really like a prerequisite before doing medical intuition. And it's really something that every psychic should do is learn to control their clairsentience. Um, the, the, very, the, the most important way to do that is that you have to become really self-aware. Um, and so you have to become self-aware physically and emotionally. That means you have to make it a practice to kind of tune into your body and ask yourself, you know, how am I feeling? And then also to tune in and ask yourself emotionally, how am I feeling? And one thing that helps with that, of course, is therapy. So I recommend that all healers get therapy, spend some time in therapy during your lifetime, even if you think you have no issues, because if you think you have no issues, you definitely do. <laughs> Those are the ones that have the most issues, the ones who say, oh, I'm perfectly healthy. Um, get therapy. Why? Because it trains you to reflect on your feelings. You can also do mindfulness training, which is another way of learning how to become more conscious of your body and your emotions. And when you get more clear about what it is you're feeling, then you're in a better position to distinguish what you're feeling from what you're picking up from somebody else. And and so what I do, what I had to learn to do at a certain point when I was getting control of my clairsentience is I had to start asking myself every time I felt something, is this mine or is this someone else's? And so, uh, and I do that to this day, if I'm walking around and all of a sudden I feel sad out of the blue, <laughs> I have to, I immediately ask myself, what happened to make me sad? Did something happen? Why am I sad? What's going on? If there is nothing I can find in my life that made me sad, and of course, you're not going to find it if you're not emotionally self-aware. You have to be in the practice of recognizing your emotions and, and claiming them. You can't walk around saying, I'm fine when you're not fine. You have to really know when you're not fine. <laughs> and when I was younger, I didn't know when I was not fine. I was a stoic. I was raised that way to just, you know, soldier on, don't talk about your feelings. And, you know, and I didn't even know how to say that I was sad. Um, but I, I did a lot of therapy and now I know when I'm sad. And when I catch myself feeling an emotion like sadness or anger or anything, grief, and it's not mine, what I then do is I trace it to its origin. And so I kind of imagine a, a string of light going for me and then I trace it. Where does it go? And it's going to go to another person. So if you're in a crowded room and you suddenly feel sad and you have no reason to be sad, you can just kind of trace that line of light to where it's coming from energetically. And when you are aware of where it's coming from, then you can cut that cord, cut that. So cutting that cord is just about, if you just imagine that you have a pair of scissors in your hand, energetic scissors, and you just cut your connection to the person that's sad. And now if you don't have to cut the connection, if you want to help them, and uh, that's the reason you picked up their emotion is because you're a healer and you're meant to help them in that moment and you've chosen to help them, that's fine. You can stay connected, but you don't want to be in a situation like you mentioned where you're just picking up stuff randomly and it's interfering with your life or like you said, you're keeping it. So another thing that's important is if you're, if as a healer, you are connecting Claire sentiently with your clients, which is, you know, often inevitable. You have to, first of all, be aware you're doing that. Be aware that like if you're a Reiki practitioner and you're working, have someone on your table, you have to be aware if you're energetically connected to them during the session. If you're a nurse and every time you have a patient in your office, you're connecting to them energetically, you're going to go home at the end of the day exhausted because all these patients will be connected to you energetically. And I know this because I used to do this with all my students. I would stay connected to all of them and I would be exhausted. And so 
it's a good idea if you're in the in the healing field, whatever your doesn't matter which um, healthcare profession you're in or which healing profession to get in the habit every day at the end at the end of each interaction with each patient, do some kind of ritual to release them or to cut your connection with them. And then at the end of the day, do a bigger ritual of, okay, I'm leaving all of this at the office. I'm not bringing any of this with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This brings me to yet another question. If you do still have this connection, it can go both ways, right? You're not just taking in their symptoms. They can also drain you. Is that accurate? Oh yeah, they can drain you. And this is another thing you can do. You burn sage. You can burn sage or Palo Santo, whatever, also to clear the energy. Um, yeah, they can they can drain you. You could also uh, you could also send them energy that's not good for them if you're not a totally clear vessel. And so this is another thing that's important is you have to be a hollow bone. And the, the idea of a hollow bone it comes from Fool's Crow, who's a Lakota medicine man who was. I had a couple of books written about him and he was a healer and he talked about how the healer has to be a hollow bone. You've got to get out of the way so that the healing can work through you. We're just vessels. If you're not a hollow bone, if you're bringing your stress and anxiety and different, you know, upset into your, your practice room or your session room, you might, you know, accidentally uh, share that with the client. And so all of that inner work is so important and it has to be done uh, on, a, on a continual basis. Every day, um, there has to be that check-in with yourself. You have to be aware of your emotions. And if you're upset, you might have to just cancel. You can't work with clients when you're very upset. You have to cancel. Also, if you're sick, you have to cancel because if you're, so, if you're sick, it might not only impede your ability to be accurate, that's the biggest threat. This is going to impede your ability to be accurate. Um, but, you know, it can, you know, people can, people can also kind of pick up or resonate with your low energy because you're a healer. When you're in a position of um, power over somebody, which you always are as a healthcare provider or a healer, there's always a power dynamic there. Um, same with teachers. People can kind of uh, match your energy uh, unconsciously. And so if you come into a session, you know, down and out, they might walk out of the session down and out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you have to really uh, work on self-awareness to do this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, now, the other question, the burning question was, uh, you were talking uh, a few minutes ago about the different traditions that you studied with, the, the different ethnic traditions. And I wonder... Um, is there anything specific that you can come to mind uh, that's that's different in these different traditions from, you know, just sort of the mainstream American method? And what are the commonalities between the different traditions? OK, well, you know, um, one thing that that a lot of people aren't aware of is that medical intuition is a very old tradition. Um, and so in the book that I'm working on now called The Medical Mystic, one of the things I'm doing is, is telling the history of medical intuition. And, you know, there are traditions throughout the world in indigenous communities in Africa in North and South America in the you know, Pacific Islands of healers who engaged in what used to be called psychic diagnosis. And we now call it medical intuition. And so if you go to the Philippines, um, you know, there's a Babylon um, tradition. If you go to Hawaii, there's the, you know, the Kahuna, Haha, -ha, who do, do that type of work. If you go to South Africa, there's the Sangoma tradition. And, um, and then in, in a lot of Native American uh, communities, there's uh, medicine people who also psychically diagnose. Um, and so what we have gotten kind of passed down to us in the mainstream is kind of a non-ethnic, a cultural version that kind of presents itself as universal, which of course it's not. And it also doesn't acknowledge its heritage. So for example, um, you know, Carolyn Miss and Norm Sheely coined the term medical intuition, um, but Norm Sheely actually learned about medical intuition from Henry Rucker and Henry Rucker's organization. And Henry Rucker was, um, an African-American psychic in Chicago 
who had his own psychic research organization. And he brought eight other African-American medical intuitives to Norm Sheely's lab to be tested. And Sheely found that he was, that their group as a whole was 98% accurate in diagnosing any patient he gave them. But, you know, that history is kind of forgotten. And, and then Sheely and, and Miss went on to coin the term and to write all these books. And there isn't really an acknowledgement of that African-American history of the tradition. And so that's one of the things I'm, I'm hoping to rectify. Uh, but one thing I can, I can point out that is um, different besides the, just the absence of any discussion <laughs> of culture <laughs> is also has to do with tools. So, um, like I was taught by different teachers and when I had um, teachers from the mainstream culture, um, they would teach me that I should do all of my work without any tools. And so no sage, no sweet grass, no crystals, no, um, no ritual objects, no special clothing, um, no altar behind me. What you see behind me is a giant altar. Um, and I have, I work with altars. Well, there, there was kind of this expectation that this work is supposed to proceed in kind of a clinical way, uh, devoid of culture, devoid of tools, um, no art, no beauty, no music. That's the other thing, music. I use music in my work. Um, and, and there's a way in which um, traditions which use those elements like chanting and music and smoke and and dance and uh, different things are are sometimes portrayed as you know primitive or superstitious, and yet if you do the same exact work, right? Medical, we call it medical intuition, and we put you in an office with white walls. <laughs> Suddenly, it's like a legitimate <laughs> practice. It's the same exact thing, and so I have practiced both ways. I can I can practice with absolutely no um, cultural tools. But I prefer to practice now with my cultural tools. And so when my clients come in to see me, I have an altar, I have crystals, I burn sage, I play music. So Feggio frequencies in the background, it's very relaxing. I have art that I put up in the room. I decorate the rooms that I've rented, I will decorate them. And that's coming from the, from the um, ethnic traditions that I come from. And, and that's one big difference I've seen. Um, in, and, and I would say, well, that's probably enough of an answer, right? I could probably, I could probably come up with some more, but. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, I, I get what you're saying, but I would love to hear you put it into words what, what the difference is uh, when, when you're setting the scene so that you're vibing in a certain way as opposed to sitting in a blank room how does the, where you're setting the scene, how does that improve your ability or does it improve your ability or does it just, does it help it flow? What, what's the difference? Okay. Well, you know, I'm going to answer that. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about why there's this difference, I think, having to do with the cultural difference around perception of the healer. Um, but the reason I do that is for, for a couple of reasons. The purpose of ritual is to get you in the right frame of mind. And so a lot of people outside of ritual don't understand it and they just see it as, oh, why are you engaging that repetitive weird behavior, right? But people who are actually healers and teachers, we know what the purpose of ritual is. It's, it's not really important that you do things in a certain way. What's important is that you get in the right frame of mind to do the work. And when you engage in certain rituals, what it does is it signals to yourself as the healer and also to the client that you are taking this very seriously. So I'm not casually just walking into a room and sitting down and saying, so what do you want to, you know, what do you want to know, right? I'm bringing them in. I'm sitting them down. I'm making sure they're comfortable offering them some water. I'm then, you know, I've set up the area and they can see that I've taken a lot of care in setting up the room. I'm then burning some herbs and I'm explaining to them, you know, I'm burning this. This is, you know, helping to um, 
cleanse the air. And so there's a spiritual purpose in, in burning the herbs. You're, you're cleansing the air of energy that you don't want there. But it's also very calming for the client. When you burn sage or sweetgrass, it has a calming effect. And they've done scientific studies on this now. It's calming. It also kills viruses and bacteria in the air. It's also, you know, it's good for COVID. <laughs> um, but it has a calming effect. The music that I play I play these solfeggio frequencies and, you know, in different cultures, people use different types of music, but it all pretty much has the same purpose. And that's to affect the energy of the room and then also to calm the people down or to get the people to enter into more of a trance or more of an altered state where they can kind of put their, um, their big, their ego to the side because people can come in and kind of want to control things when they're just really thinking with their ego mind or their, you know, their conscious mind. But if you, relax them enough that they're entered more into that kind of um, dream state, then they're open to receiving more information from their higher self. And, you know, the role of the medical intuitive is to add, is to, is to help the, the client learn how to advocate for themselves with their healthcare practitioners. And so you're helping them to be more open to what is their body saying? You're helping them to be more open to what is their higher self trying to communicate to them? Do they have any guides trying to communicate with them? So when my clients sit down in my sessions, they're really entering into kind of a, uh, a trance with me. And so a lot of times when I'm with clients, they will see some of the same things I see or hear some of the same things I hear. So it's an immersive experience. They're not just listening to me. They're not just an audience member of me performing, right? They're participating in their own healing. And all of those, those tools, which have been used for millennia in so many cultures by medicine people because they know they work, they help to facilitate that relaxation, that openness, that connection with higher self. And they also signal to, to the client that you're really serious about this. And it also, for the healer, it's reminding you, this is serious business, right? This is not something casual. I'm in a ceremony now, right? So I run my sessions like ceremonies. And um, it, it makes me think of another, I think it's related to another difference. And that has to do with the role of the healer in the culture. So if you're trained in, like when I was trained in the native community, when I was trained in the sweat lodge tradition, I was trained as a firekeeper. And one of the things that was impressed upon me by my teacher was that the most important thing was that I have my mind in the right space, that I have a good heart, right? And that my whole purpose is to help. It's all about service. And that I have to be a good person and that I have to make sure I'm living a good life if I'm going to be a healer. And you find that in so many communities of color that in order to be a healer, it's not enough to have gifts. You have to be a good person. You have to live a good life. And so there's a certain responsibility that you have. There's a certain relationship you have with your client um, where it's not, they're not a consumer. They're not just somebody that's interacting with you for an hour. This is somebody you have a responsibility to as a healer. Um, and so I do think that's very, something that's very, that's emphasized a lot in the, um, the African-American and Caribbean and native communities where I was trained. And, and it wasn't emphasized as much in the other training I received. That's a fascinating difference. And it actually brings up the fact that you've written a book called The Ethical Psychic. Yes. How is this related? <laughs> you know, it's funny because as I was talking, I was like, well, I guess this is why I wrote this book. Um, <laughs> you know, as I was, I've been teaching, um, you know, psychic development for the last um, several years, it, maybe like eight years. And um I found myself again and again talking about this, talking about you know being a good person, talking about being of service, talking about the responsibility that the psychic has to the people that they're helping. And I talked about it so much, some of my students became annoyed. Some of my students left. They were like, we don't wanna talk about this. We just want you to tell us how to be good psychics, right? 
And, but my course was called develop your um, sixth sense to shift your consciousness. I had this really long title. <laughs> and then I changed it to conscious psychic. And I told people, I'm not just teaching you psychic development. I'm teaching you how to be a conscious psychic. I'm teaching you how to do it in a way that's going to actually contribute to the world. And, and, and I, I know that I was different in that way from their other teachers. Um, and so there just aren't, from, from what I've heard and from what I experienced when I was a student, there aren't a lot of classes, kind of mainstream psychic classes, which focus on that. You typically have to go study with a medicine person to get that type of training about character and service. But we live in a culture now and we live in times now where um, with the democratization of, of knowledge, with, with the internet, everybody has access to everything. And a lot of information that used to be esoteric, you know, hidden is now exoteric. It's all being shared. So like the, May the Mayans, you know, they, they hid their knowledge for hundreds of years after the conquest and now they've shared it. You know, it's happening in Tibet. It's happening all over that people are sharing their knowledge and now anybody can study anything. You just go online and study, you can take a class. And this is a good thing. But one of the dangers of it is that people are extracting the technology and leaving behind the ethics. And so I felt like I needed to write a book about this so that all of these people who are out there, you know, just making their own path, trying to learn on their own, and they don't have a teacher, could get some of the information from the book. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because that's always been one of my sort of pet peeves about the occult. Uh, the word occult just means hidden. Uh, it doesn't, a lot of people think it means evil, but no, it means hidden. And there's a reason this information has remained hidden because responsibility is a big, big, big part of this. So I'm really glad that, that you're addressing this. I'm also really looking forward to your book, Medical Mystic. I can't wait until you're done with that. Um, <laughs> I want to make sure we're we're running a little bit low on time, so I want to make sure that I mention you. You've got a couple websites, but uh, let me mention uh, drbestmedicalintuitive.com, and doctor is just the letters dr drbestmedicalintuitive.com, and then you've got medicalintuitiontraining.com. Uh, tell us the difference between those sites. Okay, so the first site, Dr. Vest Medical Intuitive, is the site I've had for many years, and you may look at it and say it looks kind of outdated. <laughs> because it's an old site. I know. <laughs> um, but that's the site that I used to um, work with clients. And, and then in the last couple of years, I have been uh, taking a break from clients and focusing on writing my books. And I have four books I'm working on and also um, moving a lot of my classes online. And I was teaching classes um, all over the place. And I was getting on planes every two weeks and uh, just everywhere teaching. And I, while I enjoyed that, it's time now, uh, according to my guides, for me to start teaching um, on different platforms. And so I created uh, medicalintuitiontraining.com. It's an online school. Um, it's actually the, the URL for my online school, Metatron's Academy. And the first course that I'm teaching on Metatron's Academy is uh, a medical intuition certificate course. And so this is a course I used to teach live over a period of uh, four weeks. And now you can take it at your, at, at your own pace online. Um, and it's, it's, you know, reasonably priced. Most medical intuition courses out there are really expensive <laughs> and mine is not expensive. Um, and so that's why I created that site. Um, and then I also created a little community uh, on Mighty Networks called the Super Sensory Society. And so that first website, Dr. Best Medical Intuitive, you, from there you can get to my community, you can get to my, my school, you can find out about you know, how I work. Um, but I'm not taking clients right now. So people keep you know, writing me or calling me, and, no, not right now, <laughs> maybe in the future. <laughs> Right. That's good to know. Uh, you know, I've got a thousand more questions for you, but we've, we've, uh, we're just about out of time. So let me ask you, is there anything that you still got on your mind that you want to make sure that we cover before we go? Oh, let's see. Do I? <laughs> um, hmm. Well, I guess um, something I, I always like to talk about is the global shifted consciousness, you know, um, 
you know, I've been saying for some time that we're in the middle of a, of a global shift in consciousness. And um, some people right now are really questioning that because we're going through a lot of hard times right now with the pandemic and um, with the reversal of Roe and um, just so many challenging things that we're facing right now that look like regressions rather than progressions. And yet the whole idea of a global shift is that we're gonna move forward, right? In consciousness. <laughs> Um, but I do believe it's true that we are shifting forward. And I think what we're experiencing right now is some of the growing pains, some of the kind of last gas behavior of a dying empire and of an old way of thinking. And, and so everything that I do is really guided by that. And, and everything that I do is guided by my guides. And so I don't actually make, I don't really make decisions about what I'm going to teach and what I'm going to do, what I'm going to write about, you know, I'm guided by my, my spirit teachers and they have really encouraged me to, um, to develop this online course for medical intuition because more medical intuitives need to be trained, um, and this is a part of the global shift in consciousness that, that we're in um, because we need a new paradigm for healing. And right now, the healthcare system in the United States is, um, is really flawed, especially when it comes to women and people of color. And so a lot of women, you know, so many of my clients that come to me are women who have experienced medical gaslighting where they go to the doctor and the doctor tells them, you're not sick, you just think you are. You know, it's all in your head, you're emotional or you're, you know, it's psychosomatic or whatever, whatever story they're told, it's never the truth. And, and then they come to me out of desperation only, you know, people go to medical intuitives as a last resort. Uh, but my, the vision I have that's been given to me for, for the future of healthcare is that we are able to integrate medical intuition into mainstream healthcare so that, um, you know, doctors and nurses and, and acupuncturists and Ayurvedic doctors and, and all of these other practitioners have more uh, information at their disposal. Because a lot of times the reason that um, patients are not getting answers from their doctors is because the, the, the medical establishment doesn't know. They don't understand a lot of things. And they're also really restricted to only one way of accessing information, and that's empirical, right? And so if it can't be, it can't be um, measured or studied scientifically, it's not going to be considered legitimate in, in medicine. But we know that intuition is another source of knowledge, and we can combine those two sources of knowledge. You know, I'm, I have a background in science and philosophy and psychic. And I know that if you combine logic and empiricism and intuition, all three sources of knowledge, then you're really in the best position to help somebody who's sick. And so my vision for the future is that we'll all be working together, that when you go to, an, uh, to get help, you will go to a clinic that has a medical intuitive, and it might also have a uh, allopath Western doctor. It might also have a Chinese, you know, traditional Chinese doctor or some other or Ayurvedic doctor and there'll be all of these different people working together and we'll be able to, um, you know, really move medicine forward. And we have some evidence that this is the case already. Um, and I'll give you one example, MS. Uh, for years, I've been picking up from my clients that have MS, that there's a viral cause. And if you read the, the book by the medical medium, who's become you know, famous, he also wrote about how MS is caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. Same thing that I've been picking up for years. Well, just this year, they did a study at Harvard and they found that all MS patients have Epstein-Barr virus. And for the first time, they're looking at it as a cause because all this time they've never understood what causes MS. So they've just been treating the symptoms. Well, there's a lot of conditions like that where medical intuitives are accessing root causes, but the science hasn't been done yet to investigate it, but the science could be done to validate it, right? 
And so I, I would really like to see more of that done in the future. And I think that's the, the future of, of medical intuition and, and what we have to offer. Ah, uh, from your mouth to God's ears, goddess, whatever you call that. <laughs> wow. This has been such a fascinating conversation. I so appreciate you spending some time with us. Um, gosh, thank you again, Dr. Vest. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. My pleasure. I want to remind everyone I've been talking with Dr. Jennifer Lisa Vest, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this conversation in the Intuitive Medicine Summit.